Symbiosis family and all dear students. Myself, Ms. Devki Gokhale, faculty of Symbiosis School of Biomedical Sciences, would like to extend a warm welcome to all gathered here for this event. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce everyone to our institute. SSBS was established as a new initiative of Symbiosis International University in the year 2011 under the Faculty of Health and Biomedical Sciences to address the need of a school devoted to training, research and development in the field of biomedical sciences. SSBS is a premier institute for quality education and is engaged in conducting research of highest caliber in areas of stem cells, biomaterial and tissue engineering, clinical biochemistry, public health nutrition, cancer biology, avian viruses and vaccine development, bacterial and metabolic engineering, food science and technology, product development, nutrition education and health promotion. SSBS simultaneously prepares highly skilled and trained professionals in the field of biotechnology and nutrition and dietetics at master's and PhD level. Our institute also has several national and international academic as well as research collaborations. We also have dynamic faculties with international exposure and experience in premier national institutes. Today, SSBS indeed feels proud to host this symposium on emerging trends in biomedical sciences which was taken up with an objective of encouraging spirit of research and innovation, as well as disseminating new advancements in the field of biomedical sciences, which also happens to be our motto. To begin with, I would like to invite the guest speakers for today, Dean Faculty of Health and Biomedical Sciences and Director SSBS to please come and join us on the dais. Yes, yes. I request Director SSBS, Dr. Vinay Kumar Rai, sir, to welcome Dean Faculty of Health and Biomedical Sciences, Dr. Rajiv Yaravadikar, sir, with a bouquet of flowers. I request Deputy Director SSBS, Dr. Anuradha Vaidya Ma'am, to felicitate Dr. Kalida Shetty, sir, Professor, North Dakota State University, USA. I request Dr. Neetu Mishra, Ma'am, Associate Professor, SSBS, to felicitate Dr. Rajneesh Kumar Chaturvedi, sir, Scientist, Indian Institute of Toxicology Research, Lucknow. I request Dr. Anand Khandvekar, sir, faculty SSBS, to felicitate Dr. Subba Rao, sir, scientist D, assistant director at the extension and training division of National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. I request Dr. Ram Kulkarni, sir, faculty SSBS, to felicitate Mr. Vivek Kulkarni, sir, technical manager Christian Hansen, Mumbai, India. We also have Dr. Lena Yolekar, ma'am, who is one of the guest speakers. She would be joining us shortly. I request all the honored on the stage to kindly li light the lamp.
Thank you, everyone. I would now like to invite Dr. Vinay Kumar Rai, sir, Director SSBS, to address the audiences. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us at this eventful day. I welcome Dr. Rajiv Eradikar, our Dean, Dr. Shetty, Dr. Rao, Dr. Chaturvedi, and Shri Kulkarni. Distinguished invitees, scientists, and guests in the audience. I have the honor to introduce you to Dr. Eradikar. He's our beloved Dean of Faculty of Health Sciences. Dr. Rajiv Eradikar graduated from prestigious BJ Medical College, Pune in 1985, securing top honors in general surgery and obstetrics and gynecology. He completed his master's in obstetrics and gynecology in 1989 and was awarded the gold medal by Pune University for his outstanding academic performance. He has been awarded PhD under the Faculty of Management by Savitribai Phule University, Pune. Dr. Rajiv topped the list of successful candidates of the Maharashtra Public Service Commission and joined the BJ Medical College, Pune. His total teaching experience is, as of today, 29 years. He was invited by the Ministry of Health Sultanate of Oman from 1992 to 1996, where his work was highly appreciated. On completion of this assignment, Dr. Rajiv conceptualized and established the Faculty of Health and Biomedical Sciences at the Symbiosis International University, which provides on-campus healthcare services, offers academic programs pertinent to healthcare sector, and undertakes community-oriented healthcare research projects. Dr. Rajiv is a member of various governmental bodies including former member of the Board of Governors of the Medical Council of India, popularly known as MCI, Government of India, Governing Council of the Consultancy Development Center, CDC of the DSIR, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, Central Supervisory Board, PCPND, DT of the Government of India, National Inspection and Monitoring Committee, NMC, <laughs> PC and PNDT, Government of India, Maharashtra Medical Council, MMC, Maharashtra Nursing Council, Government of Maharashtra, various professional bodies like the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India, FOGSI, Indian Society for Critical Care Medicine, that is ICCCM, Society for Emergency Medicine in India, SEMI, Indian Healthcare Quality Forum, IHCQF, Maratha Chamber of Commerce in Industry and Agriculture, MCCIA, Indian Medical Association, IMA, and non governmental organizations like FICCI, popularly known as FICI, National Health, MCCIA, etc. He is also a member of the Managing Committee, Symbiosis Society of Board Management, Symbiosis International University. Currently, he is the Dean of the Faculty of Health and Bi Biomedical Sciences of our university. Dr. Rajiv has contributed a number of articles on various subjects in many of the leading uh, journals, publications. He has presented a number of oriental, the original research articles, both at the national and international level. Dr. Rajiv is proficient in English, Hindi, Marathi, Arabic, and German. No Khainmal. Herzlicher Willkommen, Dr. Rajiv. So I invite Dr. Rajiv, sir, to deliver his inaugural address. Normally, when the person at the podium reads out my CV, I realize that it's not relevant to the audience which is seated. But today I was 
keeping my fingers crossed and i was holding my horses so as to say till dr ale read out every relevant ir in brackets as a prefix details of my cv because it emphasized very pragmatically how much of me is away from the discussions that are going to happen today as a clinical scientist as a gynecologist i feel as a square peg in a round hole and peg in that sense because we are on a defense services campus here and so peg can have different connotations at the outset my congratulations to the sembasa school of biomedical sciences for having organized this wonderful session i say so because it's been a couple of months that dr ale dr anuradha and everyone of us we were sitting down and discussing what this symposium should be and what should be the topics and what should be the who should be the speakers and i must say that since then the two of them and the entire faculty at the school of biomedical sciences has been at it trying to uh, understand what the current relevant burning topics are facing the school of biomedical sciences and the biomedical sciences fraternity in general and the topics which you have chosen and more importantly the speakers you have gathered and assembled here speaks volumes of your application dedication and research which has gone in uh, formulating this session so a first round of applause to the school of biomedical sciences for having gathered such luminaries for this important session and i must acknowledge on stage the presence of dr kalida shetty welcome sir dr rajnish kumar chaturvedi welcome sir dr subha rao and Mr Vivek Kulkarni as i understand Lena is to be joined uh, Dr Lena would be joining us subsequently but i also do acknowledge in the present in the crowd the uh, in the audience the presence of Dr Verma welcome Dr Verma Brigadier Divekar the director of the Symbiosis Institute of Management Studies the host to this wonderful campus Professor Sonapan Joshi from the school uh, college of nursing and various other uh, dignitaries and most importantly the students who are to be the beneficiary of uh, beneficiaries of these wonderful uh, wonderfully enlightening sessions um uh, i was glancing through the topics which are mentioned in the uh, preamble of this conference and i i saw a lot of interdisciplinary component ranging from clinical to social to uh, physical sciences including food nutrition food um, handling food security food labeling and so on and so forth and as a clinical scientist as dr ali might have impressed upon you as a gynecologist i am a clinical scientist a little away from social and uh, physical sciences but physical sciences do form the basis but as clinical sciences we are probably working in silos we are more fixed with our patients not bad not bad it is indeed also the need of the hour where we come out with evidence based clinical research or research based evidence is undertaken and having been trained in a government medical college and a government medical hospital we we were very clinically rich which is unfortunately the bane of today's private medical colleges where the clinical footfalls are so less that they cannot indulge into meaningful clinical research and as now the dean of the faculty of health and biomedical sciences which encompasses besides the school of biomedical sciences the college of nursing which dr sonapan joshi represents and the institute of health sciences of which i am the director we do look, do a lot of interdisciplinary research and research has been the focus and the buzzword uh, in a recent uh, 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 in the recent 7 8 years at symbiosis as we evolved into our second generation of uh, second decade of existence since we got our deemed university university status in 2002 and brigadier diveka would um, support me in that as we underwent this nac exercise accreditation by the national assessment and accreditation board and i'm delighted to share with you also we got re accredited with an a grade with a cgpa of 3.58 and divekar sir was the chairman of the entire nac exercise <laughs> and you students are the beneficiaries of this system of this system of education and tomorrow when you go out into the market and you say that you've passed out from a university which has been accredited with a grade by a national assessing and accrediting body it speaks volumes of your training and research and interdisciplinary research spanning across the seven faculties we've got seven faculties at the um, university encompassing management which is a predominant one law it health sciences engineering humanities and social sciences 
and so on and so forth. But the objective is to promote research and promote research in a transdisciplinary manner, an interdisciplinary manner, a multidisciplinary manner. So how do we get the big wigs from each of these faculties? And as deans, we've been given this important task in this coming couple of years to foster an interdisciplinary approach towards research because research cannot and should not be done in silos. And some of you have visited our campus at a university campus at Lovely and you would be uh, delighted to learn that as we set up the Symbiosis Hospital and as we set up the Center for Health Skills there, there is an interesting component which we are setting up called as a Health Science Technology Park which Dr. Anand is handling. Because our neighbor on the other side of the main arterial road of the university campus is the Symbiosis Institute of Technology or our engineering college. The idea is to foster Symbiosis engineering with medicine so that the medical students know some aspects of engineering and the engineering students understand some aspects of medicine. And this need not happen in formal structured classroom sessions. It can happen in the cafeteria, it can happen in the mess, it can happen in the play field. The idea is they live together, eat together, study together and evolve beautifully innovative concepts. Something, the seed of which symbiosis was sown by Professor Dr. Muzumdar way back in the early 70s. So we are coming back, life is coming back a full circle and we are trying to translate his vision, his dream into a reality at the university campus at Lowry and across all seven faculties. And towards this end, in 2017, May 2017, we envisage having an interdisciplinary seminar where health would be the central fulcrum. And as I speak in the capacity of the Dean of the Faculty of Health and Biomedical Sciences, health would be the central fulcrum and then we would be talking about healthcare management, healthcare IT, healthcare laws, healthcare engineering issues, healthcare architecture, and trying to show that health becomes the common denominator. And across all disciplines, it is health which tries to fuse everyone together because you, as a common man on the street, you may not ask, understand IT, you may not understand probably law, you may not ha understand engineering issues. But when it comes to my health, as a common man on the street, I am aware and I want the best possible standards of healthcare delivery. There is no compromise. Even the beggar on the street wants to go to a Fortis hospital or a, a Max hospital because it's supposed to be the best. He would not compromise if the same uh, treatment is given at a lesser discounted rate in a public hospital. He would probably have chai in a tapri, but when it and he can forgo the chai in a five-star hotel. But when it comes to healthcare delivery, everyone is very possessive. Everyone wants to say Al is well here. That's, that's, that's the, the importance of health. And the, the topics which you have chosen and pertinent among them are some of the uh, topics in a, on, on, a, on a podium. A, a dean is not supposed to admit his uh, ignorance and uh, uh, you know, illiteracy on certain topics. But let me be audacious enough to say that I understand very little of neurodegenerative disorders. And there are experts who are sitting there and all what I can quote of neurodegenerative disorders because whatever we learnt in medicine is way back about 25, 30 years. And there was this gentleman who was asked that as you age in the early 70s, uh, you would be caught up with neurodegenerative disorders. So he said, what? So the doctor says, you have a choice. What would you prefer? Would you prefer to have Parkinsonism or would you prefer to have Alzheimer's? So Parkinsonism is a disorder, you know, where uh, they have tremors, rigidity and um, motor disability. And Alzheimer's is they forget what they are doing. So the guy takes a pause and says, I would rather have Parkinsonism. The, the physician says, the, the, the attending doctor says, why did you choose Parkinsonism over Alzheimer's? He says, Doc, at age 70, I prefer Parkinsonism over Alzheimer's simply because in Alzheimer's or in Park, rather in Parkinsonism, I will at the most spill half of my vodka. But God damn it, I will at least remember where I've kept my vodka. <laughs> so that's all what I know of neurodegenerative disorders. And that's something which is, which is uh, that's my level of competence if I were to humbly say. In vaccinology, we are doing uh, some sort of work. We are doing with, uh, we're trying to establish a capacity building program with the Serum Institute and Lena would be joining us uh, shortly in the afternoon as the uh, compare said. 
But vaccinology is something which we are particularly um, uh, interested. It excites us because we do with a lot of student health, pediatric health, and we are trying to uh, set up a capacity building program, trying to train general practitioners. And when I say general practitioners, it's not the MBBS doctors alone, but the Ayurvedic and homeopathic doctors, trying to give them a basic standard, new, uh, scientifically based uh, um, uh, knowledge of vaccines. Because today they are practicing as vaccinologists without properly understanding the entire gamut of operations of vaccine therapy. We are also talking about food and nutrition and that excites me because relevant to this forum of discussion, we uh, did a five-year longitudinal study on childhood obesity along with the KEM hospital, the studies of which have been published in the British Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, specifically the archives of childhood diseases and I was one of the co-authors and we found that the incidence of childhood obesity is increasing. But what probably also intrigues me is the food fads that is emerging amongst these young generations, sir. Everyone wants to be a Lina, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Karina or a Katrina. Everyone wants to be Salman. As a gynecologist, I understand what hazards and havoc it plays on the uh, girl's health, and I'm particularly concerned about the girl child. And as a gynecologist, they are specifically co close to me. Sorry, guys. But uh, we understand the implications of this food fads on the, uh, on, the, on the young adolescents. We are talking about food labeling, we are talking about food security and so much of EP and Maggie's in the market, I don't need to elaborate more on it. But the KM study has thrown a lot of uh, insight into what these food habits are. And today why children get addicted uh, to foods, there are calories of convenience when the mother wants to pack up something quick fast food and put them in the daba. Calories of commercialization where a Maggie or some fast food joint, you know, uh, professes that it is better than homemade upma or pohe. So there are a lot of calories of convenience, comfort, com commerce, so on and so forth. And this is something which we need to address as, uh, as scientists working in this field. And the public health challenges are beyond all this. And relevant to this point of discussion and interjection is I am delighted to inform the audience and the learned dais that Symbiosis is now going to set up from 2016 an Institute of Culinary Arts. Whereas there are institutes of catering technology and uh, food by the diamond dozen in the country, there are very few institutes of repute in the country who offer a training program in culinary arts and none other than Chef Sanjeev Kapoor is supposed to be, is going to be the mentor of this program. So, we are trying to enter into this food secure, um, uh, industry in this sense by way of capacity building in the field of culinary arts. And I was, as, as I was discussing with the Vice Chancellor a uh, couple of days and the Principal Director, uh, Dr. Vidya, we said, I, I, I shared with her, uh, Dr. Rajni Gupte, our Vice Chancellor's husband is named Rajiv. Principal Director Dr. Vidya, I am her husband, it's Rajiv. There's another Rajiv sitting in the, uh, in the audience as I shared. And I said, I started off with gynecologists. I said the best gynecologists in the world are men. One of them is me. The best chefs in the world are men, Sanjeev Kapoor, so on and so forth. And the best husbands in the world are also Rajivs. <laughs> and I didn't stop at that. I said you have three women endorsing that. Starts off with Sonia Gandhi saying yes. Starts off with the Vice Chancellor saying yes. Starts off with the Principal Director saying yes. And starts off with the Campus Wife saying yes. Rajivs are great. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Today, as sir said, we all are happy and honored to have all these uh, distinguished speakers with us. So uh, we are eagerly look, looking forward to the sessions. So without wasting much time, I request all the dignitaries on the dais to kindly join the audiences. And I call upon stage uh, Dr. Ram Kulkarni, sir, to introduce our first speaker for today. Okay, good morning, friends. It's a great pleasure to have Professor Kalida Shetty with us today. He's a noted food biotechnologist in the United States and currently is affiliated within North Dakota State University since June to, uh, 2013. There he holds several important positions. He is Associate Vice President for International Partnership and Associationship. He is also the Founding Director of Global Institute of Food Security and International Agriculture. 
Along with this, of course, he is a professor in plant sciences at the same university. Regarding his educational backgrounds, he has obtained his MSc degree in 1983 from the University of Agricultural Sciences at Bangalore. His MS degree was uh, from University of Idaho, Moscow, USA in 1985 in bacteriology. Professor Shetty was awarded with the degree of PhD in 1989 from the same university in microbiology. His main research interests include metabolic biology of crops for functional foods and bioactives for human health, global food systems biology, food diversity and indigenous food systems to combat diet linked chronic diseases and of course he is also interested in metabolic biology of trace adaptation in crop plants. He has uh, been awarded with several prestigious awards including gold medals at University of Agricultural Sciences Bangalore, Science and Technology Postdoctoral Fellowship Award by Japanese Government, Lilly Teaching Fellowship, Outstanding Teacher Award, a very prestigious Jefferson Science Fellowship at US State Government. He has also been awarded with outstanding uh, uh, for outstanding contribution in research and creative activity, all this at University of Massachusetts, USA. He has several publications to his credit, including 185 original research articles, 11 review articles, 25 book chapters, and 6 patents. He has been... <laughs> Till now, he has delivered more than 164 invited talks all over the world. And last but not the least, he is editor-in-chief of Food Biotechnology, which is an international journal. He is on editorial boards of several reputed international journals. Along with this, he has also edited several books. So without taking any more time, I would like to invite Professor Shetty for his talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. Uh, it's delight. I'm uh, really uh, grateful and happy to be back here at Symbiosis. Uh, I've had a, a good uh, relationship and a friendship with Dr. Raleigh, who I met in my mother's hometown of Mangalore, India, some years ago. <coughs> and through the years, uh, we've had a good friendship. And as a result, when he was here, he invited me a few months ago. And during that time, we conceptualized uh, as we build these partnerships, particularly not just North Dakota, but uh, Symbiosis uh, as, as an institution uh, is founded on internationalization, uh, which is remarkable, uh, well before anyone thought it was. So before I uh, uh, go on to my presentation and the relevance of, of today's topic, in uh, both in terms of food security, but also its Im serious implication for public health challenges, uh, there are many young minds here, uh, so I want to give the a more educational perspective and background uh, to what I'm presenting today. <coughs> today we are in a uh, rapid tectonic shift in uh, globalization and the global economy is moving back to the Indian Ocean region with India being at the hub of this innovation. So we are in seriously in an innovation-based economy as opposed to a resource-based economy which was what happened in the last 400 years where resource-based uh, 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 development of economic systems, uh, mostly you know, taking raw material-based systems, uh, gave ascendancy to the European powers uh, in a, what was a traditionally uh, uh, Indian Ocean, Asian zone economic system. This happened about 400 years ago. So this resource-based economy has been rapidly turning over as it's happened about 100 years ago, but now it's moving into a new shape where innovation is a key driver. That means the oil prices or resource dep uh, deprivation does not limit an economic system to advance. So when we are in an innovation-based economy, uh, we need to have higher education systems that are advancing these initiatives like symbiosis. So innovation is driven by higher education, knowledge-based economy. So as we have knowledge-based economy advance, there are four key principles which young minds like you have to gather, not just gather information and get degrees, but you have to put your 
education on four critical elements. And these four critical elements are globalization. We cannot avoid globalization. We are more globally linked at many levels, from digital to our travel to every level. But more importantly, all the problems are global challenges. We cannot address that, this through single country. So globalization. Say, number two, our economic systems has to be sustainable. We cannot dig and uh, destroy and not leave it for the next generation. So we have to constantly think about next generation. Number three, we cannot think about problem solving just food security alone or public health alone or, or uh, energy security alone. These are all systems-based uh, challenges that are based on equilibrium concepts. That means one affects the other. So we need systems-based thinking in solving the problem. And the last, uh, and may, they may, there are others, but these are the four critical areas that you need to think about, is fourth, purpose-driven education that provides for all of the society. We cannot just innovate for the top uh, half of the society. We have to innovate to the whole spectrum of the society. So we are in a globalized world. We need systems-based solution. The solutions has to be sustainable, and the solution has to be equitable and, and, and provided for all of the population. So with these four principles in mind, we need to, we are an innovation-based knowledge economy, and young minds like you will be translating that. And you need to have uh, not just memorization-based strategies, but intuitive uh, innovation-based strategies in order to solve very difficult global challenges. So among the global challenges, food security is a very important global challenge. And food security is not just about feeding the people to have enough food. It, that was also important because previously, we, globally, we had a lot of poverty. And this deprivation uh, did not provide us enough of the macro and micronutrients. And we had to address the Green Revolution helped us. And, and the agriculture production systems helped us. But now, we are in a whole new platform where this uh, we still have the undernourishment globally. We have in a population that's 7.2 billion, 1 billion are still undernourished, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And this has to be addressed. But more of us, since 2001, there are 1.5 billion of us, and proportionally increasing more, who are having more macronutrients than necessary. So we are in a new crisis that we, in the same society, we have undernourishment, but also super high calories, but also deficiency of micronutrients. And as a result, we have undernourishment and the challenge of chronic, uh, preventable chronic disease, diet link chronic disease on the rise at a much rapid rate than uh, how much we need to do to our undernourishment challenges. We have to address both. So in many parts of the world, including India, we are now burdened with two catastrophic challenges which is undernourishment that we always faced with. And we have many uh, states in India where malnourishment and I know uh, underfeeding is still a challenge. But we have a tremendous growth in the obesity link, childhood obesity link crisis, as our dean so elegantly m mentioned previously. So with these two thin challenges, global food security is not just about feeding anymore, but it's also about having healthy nutrition. So uh, uh, falling into the public health domain. And what is very striking and what is very scary is you in an advanced society like United States where I teach, you have majority, 80% of the healthcare dollars for the disease solutions after the disease. Okay, for disease solution after the disease. Well, as most of the disease is preventable diseases where we spend less than 10% or 12% of the budget. So the big crisis that we are going to face is di diet link diabetes, which is India is becoming the number one country in the world in terms of the actual diabetes. Uh, actually, known diabetes is about 7%, but unknown diabetes, if you see in the ur urban poor population, urban slum areas, they are very high. Okay. And now, number two, that moving into cardiovascular disease, they're closely linked. And then you go on to the other chronic diseases, including cancer, autoimmune disease like arthritis, and ultimately the uh, cognitive breakdown diseases. So these are all preventable diseases, and therefore, 
Uh, we need a more systems-based uh, innovations founded on the basic rules of how ecology works and how we as human beings are dependent on that ecology. So unless we understand this equilibrium, we will not find the system-based logic from which we have to derive solutions where not only we address food security and have adequate food, but this adequate food must meet our health care needs. The public health needs have to be solved. And at the same time, it has to be ecologically sustainable. At the same time, it should be less uh, energy dependent, uh, where we l depend less on the fossil fuels and grow more nitrogen uh, fixing crops like our dals and lentils that need less of these uh, carbon fossil fuels based energy, but yet it's good on the ecology and good on the public health. So we need this integrated strategic approach, not only in India, but globally, but particularly India being a largely a vegetarian society. Okay. So with this in mind, I want to then now go into the, the, the global food security and public health challenges have some common principles. So my talk will be first on the principles, then I will show you examples through richer, uh, research how systems-based solutions can be the basis. So that's the foundation of my institute in North Dakota State. And North Dakota is not just restricted to helping only North Dakota. We grow surplus of legumes, surplus of many crops that we think we should put it into the global domain to address global challenges. Okay? So business anymore should not be just about business. Business should be about trying to uh, help all of the globe. So with this in mind, I'll uh, go into my talk. Oops. Oh, sorry. Okay, so currently, as I told you, we're a population of 7.2 billion and projected to, to be about 9 billion 2050. And with the African demographics growing uh, more rapidly than expected, we'll be about 10 to 12 billion by end of the century. And this, ha uh, for the first time, we have a new perspective on food and wellness. So for the first time, the public, serious public health challenges are critically linked to malnourishment, not just malnourishment challenges, but the malnourishment going towards the diet linked chronic diseases, such as diabetes. So the food health and wellness crisis is very centrally linked to the global obesity crisis. So when we address food security challenges, we will also address global food security uh, global obesity challenges. So this interlink needs to be addressed, and more so. And we are at the exciting time of technological revolutions, not just Wi-Fi systems like our iPhone and other tools, but we have a massive integration. And uh, particularly in India, you, as we see the digital India, so I was going through a number of institutions, particularly as I go going through my birthplace in near Shringeri, Jayapura in, uh, in uh, Karnataka, I can see all these digging around the roadside. And what is that? It's our digital India uh, strategy. And this is brilliant because the more we bring the global technological revolution to underpin the economic systems from agriculture to a uh, whole range of rural advancement, it's exciting. So technological revolution, uh, particularly information sciences, will be linked to all other aspects of life. And ultimately, it has to be sustainable. We cannot pollute too much. We have to control from air pollution to our ground pollution. So sanitation solution, uh, our Swachh Bharat strategies must be accelerated more rapidly from rural environments to the urban environment. So environmental consequences of sustainability are central. Uh, energy decentralized, we have to move away. Today, the global burden is 60% is of our energy is from uh, fossil fuels, petroleum and coal. So this is what's causing the global warming. So we need to slow that down before we suddenly accelerate and go to a point of no return that will be very destructive. And we are already seeing this in climate change, extreme weathers on all sides. And therefore, energy de 